Hey guys. Thank you all for uh, jumping in at a weird time. I know I've never done a stream this time, but for my schedule it worked out pretty well, so hopefully at least a decent bit of people can tune in. I'm going to do it the same as last time to where I'll just wait like five or ten minutes until some more people join, and then I'll go ahead and start the lecture. So if anyone has any questions or anything they want to talk about in the meantime, obviously, just let me know. How's it going, Dave? This stream comes at the same time I'm learning to do ESD protection. Well, isn't that convenient? Uh, let me, and I know Daniel will share it more, but for uh, black chair, black shirt, I know. I was gonna, I was thinking that earlier. It looks so weird on the uh, chair. I need to get one without a super high back. It'll look a lot better. Hey, Johnny, how's it going? Tony, hey, Jeremy. So yeah, the form that I just, or the link that I just shared, once I'm actually doing the stream, go ahead and use that to submit questions because once I'm actually doing the lecture, I'm not going to, unless there's something that comes up, hopefully we don't have any more of the spam like we did last time. But otherwise, I'll just wait till the end of the stream to answer the questions, like at the Q&A portion. Will you take questions from the live stream or exclusively from Discord like last time? So it's going to be from that form, not on Discord. Hey, JH, hey, PowerPath. Uh, let me move my screen around. Oh, geez, OBS is acting super wonky. You should do the floating head thing. I know, I need to, uh, the high back really messes it up. My desk at home, or my uh, chair for my desk at home, it doesn't have that, so it would actually be perfect, but not so much for here. Yeah, I don't know why I'm not able to see the chat separately. Weird. Your EMC series was awesome. Oh, I appreciate it. It's not over, just kind of taking a little break from it. They take so much time to do. Will you continue that series? Yeah, like I said, I'll definitely. And I'm using the, uh, I mentioned it last time, I'm using the normal latency on YouTube, so the quality's better, but the latency for when I see messages to when you see me respond is longer than normal, so it's going to be kind of goofy in that regard, but what can you do? Alright, so it's been three minutes, so yeah, I'll give it a few more minutes and then uh, switch over to doing the lecture. So yeah, again, if anyone has any questions or anything, let me know. I should like play like, I should get some way either if it can directly stream from like youtube music or amazon music or something or if i have to like do recording i should do like a loop of like elevator music while waiting for the stream to start i know some other streamers will do like the countdown and everything else while it's going put some nice elevator music that'd be nice will we get a visit from the spam bots i hope not that was a pain in the butt in the future, any plan to start on enclosure design? Not really. I mean, at like my job, we do mechanical design, but me personally, I don't do that much anymore. And I'm just really haven't gotten into it on YouTube. If you mean like with respect to like ESD testing and like the mechanic, the uh, metal enclosure and how you ground to it, that is something I've been thinking of doing. But man, that's kind of hard to get set up for. So. Maybe. We'll see. 
I'm looking forward to an EMC series that goes on long enough to actually cover immunity, the part Europe cares about that FCC doesn't cover. Yeah, so immunity, that's essentially what I was just saying. To have a good ESD test set up is kind of in the same realm there. You have to have, you can do, and I didn't cover it in this lecture, maybe I will in the future. You can use like, uh, like charcoal grill igniters to make a spark. Obviously, you can't really quantify how much it is or how strong it is, but you can actually do pretty decent like napkin math tests just using that. The countdown is repulsive. Glad you don't use it. You can play non-copyright music without any problem, I think. Maybe something that lets you loop it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how any of that nonsense works. Hey, Sanji, Sanji. All right, I think give it another minute or two, and then I'll go ahead and start it. Piezo Element Igniter, yeah, same, same thing. But actually, all things considering, some of the, uh, like, handheld, uh, some of the handheld ESD test guns actually aren't that expensive. It's just they're usually limited to a single standard. So presumably you'd want to get a pretty, like, high voltage standard if you're going to do it. So if it passes that, you at least know, at least you know that it's going to. Uh, pass power path Kyle why don't you start n10 product design course there is no course online so I actually do have kind of a course in progress like that I kind of got hung up on it it was basically not so much product design it was like a Arduino like evaluation board from start to finish then it was going to also be covering assembly, ESD, or EMC testing, all of that. Because the product design side, that's so dependent on what it actually is. Uh, post the link for questions in the video description. I like that idea. Let me do that. Actually, I don't know if I can do that while the stream is ongoing. Yeah, I don't think I can. So... I'll just post it again. Oh, I can pin it though, right? Yeah, I can pin it. I don't know what pinning it actually does. Maybe it, oh, maybe it keeps it at the top. That would be nice. Would there be a follow-up video on FET? I will need some more info on what exactly you want it to be. ESD test, use a cap and resistor and try to kill the circuit. Yeah, you need a way to charge it up though. EMC testing back at the lab would be a good tutorial. Awesome. When will your course be available? Oh, boy. Not for a while. My goal was to have it kind of mostly wrapped up by the end of last year, which didn't really turn out. I, I have the first board actually built, and I just need to go through and actually, like, uh, test it and make sure it works. That's where I kind of got stuck. Maybe write a message like submit your link and then, oh, yeah, I like that idea. Okay, there we go. Or maybe write that I've used TV flyback transformers. Yeah, you can do that. It's just it's hard to get actual like accurate numbers with it, and that's where it actually makes sense to have a uh, to have a controlled tester. Would love to see some more videos on MOSFETs, charge pump. Oh, are you kidding me? Yeah, the spam's back. Lovely. I just don't even know what their like end game is. I guess they're just trying to solicit whatever that nonsense is. All right, well, cool guys. So I think we are good to go and give it a try. So, whoops, right here. So I'm gonna have to move around probably my 
face a little bit throughout this because some of the pictures are all throughout it. And I'm going to try my best not to cover up anything, but that'll be something that I can do. I'll check the messages for that. If anybody, if it's like my face is covering and I don't see it, just let me know. But otherwise, yeah, to anyone who's just joining, if you have any questions during this, check the link that I pinned, submit them on there. And then at the end of the stream or the end of the lecture, I'll go through those questions and then give them an answer. And I'm going to try not to answer anything during it just to keep the continuous continuation of it. And game chaos. Yeah, no kidding. You cannot post a comment on YouTube without it getting flagged. But spammers, I know. Go figure. All right. So, yes, this is going to be the second lecture in this series. Uh, let me go like that there. I think that works. So this is the second lecture in the live lecture series. This one is covering designing ESD safe circuits. And I've done one or two videos in the past, and there's a lot of content out there that will talk about basically doing just that. So I wanted to structure this in a way that kind of made it different from what's out there and especially different from what I have done in the past. So instead of just going through and showing like, hey, you can do this for this, this for this, and it just go through all the different solutions that are out there, I just picked like four-ish main solutions that I will use. So four different ways that I'll use on any given circuit to help protect it from ESD. And then I'm going to be showing a lot of simulations for those. So it'll actually show kind of why you might choose one over the other. So the big takeaway here is since even though I'm only covering four, there's tons of other ways and tons of different products out there that you can use for ESD protection. So just don't think that this is like an exhaustive list or anything. It's just what I tend to use more often than not. So what exactly is ESD? Yeah, see my face is covering that a little bit there we go so what is ESD so the the traditional thing that you think of is somebody walking on a stack of carpet with socks or shoes they pick up charge and then whatever they touch gets zapped but in reality it doesn't have to be from a person it's just any static electricity that gets released from the charge source to whatever device under test or whatever is getting zapped the there's kind of two different when it comes to like integrated circuits there's two types of esd and tests the first one is device level so a device level is pretty much the main one that integrated circuit manufacturers are worried about this is if you have a bare ic if you have like a bare IC and you're in an assembly line, you're in an ESD protected environment, will it stand up to incidental ESD events in that scenario? Most, if not all ICs are designed specifically for that. The second type is called system level ESD. And this one is pretty obvious, it's the entire system. So this is when the integrated circuits are mounted on a PCB how protected can they be from ESD events that will happen throughout the life of the product. So while the device level protection that the integrated circuits have on board certainly help for system level, system level can cover anything from lightning strikes to really, really bad transients or spikes that wouldn't happen in a controlled ESD environment. That's kind of the big difference. So the first, ah, my face, yeah. Let me go down here again. So the main test, and this is the one you'll hear by far the most on data sheets for IC manufacturers is the human body model. And that is exactly what it sounds. It's simulating if a person who has a charge touches a grounded circuit board or a circuit board that is isolated but can still accept the charge, and what will it do with that? So you can see on the right-hand side the current with respect to time. You can see it's a pretty fast spike, and it's only positive. 
and for the actual test has the specific values of, can you see my mouse? Yeah, okay, cool. And it has the specific values with the voltage and they won't specify what the voltage is on any of these because even though this is the model and the test, there will be a specific standard which specifies what voltage it is at because the way these are tested, and this is the same for both the device level and the system level test, is you start at a low voltage and you keep stepping it up until eventually it does fail. And then you can say, hey, it passed to the one right below that. So that's why you don't see any of the voltages listed. The second one is the machine model. This is basically to estimate what would happen if the device under test is on a pick and place machine and it gets zapped by a machine that discharges to it. Please use laser pointer to highlight. Yeah, I don't really have that. A mouse should be fine for now. I don't think I'm gonna be highlighting much. And with this one, the big difference is it now has an inductive element in series. So you get both positive and negative spikes. Otherwise the amplitudes and everything depending on the voltage can be pretty much the same, not a huge difference. Then the third level is if you have a charged isolated device under test that then gets zapped when it touches a different discharge node. This one kind of tests the same thing as the machine level. This one's more for like conveyor belt styles. And this one again is mostly positive, but it does have a little bit of a negative peak. The gist with these, it doesn't really matter that much because you don't have to design towards the device level test. The couple big system level tests that are out there and someone had asked earlier if I was going to be doing anything on immunity in the future. And these are the series of tests that would be included in like an immunity standard. So something like CE, or if you get just something even in the US from like an inner tech or something that goes above and beyond like FCC or a standard like that. So this one is essentially the exact same, the 61,402 and the four is signifying or the two, both of these, one of these in conjunction is signifying the voltage. So 4,000 kilovolts or 8,000 kilovolts. I think this is 8,000 because it's up at 30 amps of current where 4,000 kilovolts, which is what I did the simulations of, which you'll see in a bit, peak at just around 15 amps. But it's essentially the same as the human device model, except this one is a higher amplitude because again, a system level test, you have to assume it's no longer in a controlled environment. So it could be subject to a lot larger transients. And then the 61,004-5 is, this is like a lightning strike. So it has a super fast peak, but not quite as big of an amplitude. So again, these you're designing towards if you have a specific standard that either you're required to by law or whatever device you're doing is going into an environment that requires it. You're normally not ever saying, oh, I want it to pass this standard. It's normally you get told it has to pass this standard and then work back from there. So now what happens if your device gets zapped? What are some of the consequences or no consequences? So if you are in unexpected makers streams, no damage at all, system continues as normal. And I say that as a joke, it is a, as a whole, ESD is something that is usually, usually talked about as a bigger deal than it is simply because, and I'll get to this in a bit, the IC manufacturers do bake in ESD protection on board. So as a whole, if you design your board pretty well and you design it with signal integrity and EMC in mind, you're normally going to be designing it pretty well for ESD. So if there's a zap, it could have absolutely no effect at all and it continue. The next thing that could happen is what's called like a soft failure. And that's basically something goofy happens on the firmware. 
you could have a bit flip, you could have something get skewed in the registers to where it hangs. Or sometimes worse is it doesn't hang, but it gets some garbage data that it thinks is valid, and then it screws up how it's running. So while not as common, you do see stuff like this happen, and especially in aerospace and even in like the NASA trials and in space, that's where they do like the radiation hardening and it's all to prevent like soft failures. And there's a bunch of different names for that. And then the hard failure is basically physical damage. And something that is really terrifying with ESD events is if you get a device that zaps or you have a device or in like an assembly line, just the bare IC and it gets zapped, if it just dies, that sucks, but it's not really the end of the world, especially when you're assembling a board, because you're going to test it and say, oh, something obviously happened to this, let's replace it. The worst is if it's a latent defect to where it damages something, but it doesn't immediately cause a failure, but it does in a year or six months or two years, which is an awful awful thing to have happen because you can't pinpoint how or when it happened so that's always the worst case scenario with an esd failure and it's what either way if you're designing for both or all of these your goal is to prevent any issue whatsoever even though the latent defects are at least in my mind and in most scenarios are going to be the worst case so what is our goal when we're trying to design for the hardware side? And again, if you've followed me for a while, you know that I pretty much, especially nowadays, almost only focus on hardware, both for YouTube and for work. So I'll touch later a little bit on the software firmware end, but that's not my forte. So I'm gonna be focusing on the hardware side. So what is our main goal with ESD protection for the hardware side. And someone in Discord, Sniper, has been going back and forth with different ESD questions and schemes for a while. And something that I think a lot of people get kind of confused with is you're typically not trying to prevent any transient or any spike that gets onto the board. One, it's usually not possible, and two, it's not needed. So ultimately our goal when we're designing a system to be ESD safe is not to get rid of any ESD event. It's to bring it to a level to where either the integrated circuit on board protection can easily handle it or to where it's just not at a, that high of a value to where it affects anything. So on the left here, if you see, so right here is the actual IO pin that is outside of the IC. So this is a PIC 16. So all of this is internal to the silicon and out here is where you connect to it. So you can see it has two diodes. One is biased to VDD, so 3V3 or five volts, the other to ground. So if you have a transient here, if it's positive, say a thousand volts or something, it's going to get shunted straight to your power rail. If you have a negative spike, so negative 1,000 volts, it's going to get spiked to ground. And in theory, that's going to protect the rest of the circuit. The issue is these are tiny. You have to think of a microcontroller that has tens to hundreds of I.O. pins. There's not much of the silicon that is devoted to the actual ESD diodes. So if it's a high voltage or high current, i.e. heat, it's going to just vaporize these things and then destroy the rest of the circuit. So what you can see is on here, just by having a ESD diode, it drops down that voltage to under 50 volts. So what Sniper was wondering is, at least I think he asked quite a few things, is and I'll cover this further in the video, but with like TVS diodes, it'll have a breakdown voltage, it'll have a clamping voltage, and the clamping voltage for like a 3V3 or a five volt line might be 10, 20 volts. And isn't that too high and it's going to destroy the part? No, because you have these internal 
diodes that will protect everything on the microcontroller. So if you end up trying to get rid of any transient, you're probably never going to succeed. Oh, my head was in the way again. Whoops. I'm going on a ride, roller coaster. So yeah, the goal is just to get it to a point to where it no longer damages and it takes off the strain from the onboard ESD protection, which is normally just diodes. Am I? Yep, still good. So now starting on the LT Spice simulation. So this was a simulation of the IEC 61000-4-2. So this is, oh, the numbers are the same as the initial. So then it must be the subset is what the actual voltage is. So this is set at a 4,000 volt or a 4 kilovolt spike. And from this spike, it goes through a voltage controlled switch. So at one nanosecond after start, it will discharge that across these two resistors and inductors into whatever we want to test for the ESD. And what's nice with these standards is it gives you like a calibration value. And I'm just basing this off of a uh, model that I had found. And by basing it off of a two ohm resistor, you can confirm that the simulation follows what it should in the standard, which this does at least pretty close. So it's at least a close enough approximation to where we can like qualitatively compare these. So again, with all of my EMC stuff, don't take any of these values as absolute. I'm just doing this so we can compare like different solutions between each other, not the actual like absolute value. And if the value is below a threshold, that is really hard. You have to make sure you model everything else, which for the sake of this isn't really needed. So the first simulation we're going to do is no protection. So this is simulating what is internal to the IC. This could be a microcontroller, this could be a buffer, a shift register, it could be anything. And I have just a parasitic 50 milliohm resistor here going into the two same diodes. One is biased to five volts, the other to ground. And then just to give it some arbitrary impedance, I just used a one meg resistor. Again, that doesn't really matter. It just affects the absolute value, which we don't care because they're all going to be the same. And then the series resistance or the uh, source resistance of the five volts is 100 ohms, which when we get to some of the later protection schemes, I'll cover that again. This does matter for how the top diode is biased. But again, for the most part, it won't affect the comparisons. So I just picked it because it was arbitrary. So with this, we have one of the nodes is at the GPIO, which is right here. So that is the actual entrance to where the outside world goes inside to the IC. The second node is at D10, which D10 is the top diode. For all of these tests or these simulations that I'm showing, can you see? Yeah, I think that's, no. Oh gosh, making it worse. Okay, there we go. Man, what a pain. I should have known that was gonna be an issue. If it keeps, uh, if it keeps being an issue, I'll just hide my face. Probably don't even wanna see it anyway. <laughs> so, the first one is the GPIO. The second is the top diode. So all of these simulations are going to be with just a positive spike. So the bottom diode won't have any impact on the testing. It is just going to be the top here. So for the first, we can see that the top of the peak gets up around 660 volts. And at the initial spike, it's almost to six amps somewhere in there, which again is, is arbitrary in the sense that we're not modeling everything accurate enough to say, oh my gosh, that would certainly fail, but it's a lot of current. So if you think, and if we assume that this is modeled to where it's accurate enough, six amps going through a tiny, tiny on-chip TBS or standard diode, that's a lot, and that has a pretty good chance of just burning it up. 
So the first strategy that I use a lot is throw on a series resistor. So series resistors as a whole are fantastic. They specifically for ESD events, they limit the peak current. Obviously V equals IR. So if you have a larger resistor here than the parasitic, you're going to limit the amount of current that goes anywhere downstream of this. They also help damp the ringing. If you have a higher resistance here, same with, and cover this later, with capacitors, if you can damp that, you prevent the overshoot, which can help tighten in that spike, which lowers the voltage and current, which again is what you want. It helps, like I said, protect diodes downstream. And then the other reason why I like these a lot is, and this is what I had covered at the start, is with ESD as a whole, designing circuits that are resilient to ESD makes them pretty good circuits overall. So having series resistors where you can is a really good idea overall. If you guys have seen the EMC for Everyone series that I did, I guess two videos ago where I showed how the rise time of a signal by changing the series resistors greatly impacts the amount of noise that is emitted from the uh, from the circuit in the near field and equivalently in the far field just by increasing the series resistor. So as a whole, series res resistors are always a good idea to have. So if you can see on the series, oh, I used the, I flip-flopped these or something. Crap. Well, it should be moderately better. It's not here, but believe me on that, it's moderately better, not a huge, huge difference. So then the second strategy that is quite useful is simply to just add a capacitor. And a capacitor does quite a few things. The easiest way to think of it is it just kind of like soaks up that excess voltage. This uh, capacitor, when it's discharged or semi-charged, it has more charge that it can take in. So an ESD event is super, super short it's going to take up some of that excess voltage before it can get downstream. And it has an RC filter to help with, again, acting as a low pass filter and helping with ringing. It helps to smooth out the event. And as a whole, the larger the capacitor value that you can use, the better it will perform for the sake of helping with an ESD event. But the issue is if you have high capacitance and it's a high speed signal, like USB, Ethernet, HDMI, something like that, it's going to make it to where it won't work. So capacitors, you can pretty much only throw on to protect from ESD if it is a slow speed signal or if you are making sure that it's a value that is smaller than whatever the, whatever the specifications for the signal that you are using are. And if you have too large of a capacitor that is like a ceramic that has very low ESR, you can actually make the ringing worse because you have an under damped system. So ideally you use like an electrolytic for this if possible, or just don't use a really, really big capacitor and it usually isn't a huge issue. So with adding a one nanofarad capacitor, nothing else you can see compared to the past series resistor, which again is, is somewhat off. It is night and day difference. Now the peaks, depending on if it's the GPIO or the diode, we're in the 300-ish volts for the GPIO and then three-ish amps for the diode. So cuts it about in half with just a single diode. And then if we add a 10 nanofarad capacitor, so upping it by an order of magnitude, now we are down to 54, 55 volts, and then on the current under 500 milliamps. So now that internal diode is only having to absorb or dissipate 500 milliamps across it instead of 
the six amps that would have been there before. So by just adding a single cap, it does that big of a, uh, makes that big of a difference. Now, what I'm sure most of you were waiting for, and the one of the more common ways that you see is a TVS diode. That's literally what their job is. So they essentially act as a Zener diode. In fact, a lot of times you can use them interchangeably. So if you apply a higher voltage to the cathode side, it breaks down and passes from the cathode to anode and or flip-flop that. It passes from the anode to cathode instead of the other way around. And the difference between a TVS diode and a Zener, again, this is, it really depends, but as a whole, TVS diodes have a bit faster response and their surge current rating will be higher. And the latter with the surge current rating, most of the times for a Zener diode, they don't even specify it. So it's not so cut and dry. It's just one's intended for that. So you should probably use it for it, though you don't have to. So the reverse working maximum voltage, that is essentially what it sounds like. It's the highest voltage that whatever you are protecting with that TBS diode under normal conditions, what it should be. So if you have a microcontroller that has a 3v3 GPIO logic level, if you're using a TVS diode, you have to use one that has a higher reverse, reverse working maximum voltage than 3v3, or you can do a touch higher just to give it some headroom, but it can't be below that, or you're going to be dissipating or discharging through that capacitor or through the uh, TVS diode. The clamping, the breakdown voltage is the voltage to where the diode just starts to conduct. And this is something you need to keep in mind. They don't like instantly conduct and act like a short. It's a little bit of a range. So at the breakdown voltage at that point is when it is just barely starting to conduct current. So with a, so back to the 3v3 example, if it has a reverse working maximum voltage of 3v3, it'll oftentimes have a breakdown voltage of maybe four or five volts. So at four or five volts, it is just barely starting to conduct and current is passing through it. Then there is the clamp, the clamping voltage. At this point, it is essentially the lowest resistance that it will ever get. So 100% of the current that can go through the TVS diode is going to be. And if a TVS diode, back to the 3v3 example, so the reverse working maximum voltage is 3v3, the breakdown voltage is 4 or 5 volts, the clamping voltage will be maybe 10 volts, 12 volts, 15 volts, somewhere in there. So you know, as long as that TVS diode, there we go, as long as that TVS diode does not burn up and break, it's never going to exceed on that protected line, whatever that clamping voltage is. So you can design the rest of your circuit on that line, knowing that it will never exceed that. Then the next, uh, the next definition that you don't hear about that much is the dynamic resistance. And that is basically just what is the resistance when it is fully in breakdown mode, when it is going to be conducting its maximum value, you can treat it essentially like a resistor. So this is something that is pretty important when you're choosing TVS diodes and it's something that you do need to keep in mind even though as a whole you sometimes don't have a ton of control over it simply because if you have to have a TVS diode that has a whatever capacitance value for HDMI you're kind of going to have to take what they give you but if you have a super low dynamic resistance like the TVS diode on the left has it's going to protect your protected line that much better 
because they essentially turn into just a parallel resistor network. So the lower the dynamic resistance of the TBS diode, the better and the less current that is going to get diverted to the device under test or your microcontroller. So for the next simulation that I had sh I'm showing is with a single TBS diode and something that is really, really, really important to be uh, to talk about is unidirectional and bidirectional diodes. So unidirectional diodes protect from positive. Oh, my head's in the way. Let's go over there. I think maybe. Yes, right there. Okay. <laughs> So a unidirectional diode will protect from positive and negative spikes. If you have a positive spike, so the ESD node is a thousand volts, it's going to conduct straight across to ground. If this is a negative spike, it's going to conduct from ground across to the ESD node. You do not have to use a bidirectional diode for 90 Five, 99% of the lines you're going to protect. The only time you have to use a bidirectional diode is if your signal is not only positive. If it switches from positive to negative, like RS-485 or a lot of like differential type signaling. In that case, you have to use a bidirectional or else it's going to conduct when it has a negative voltage, which you obviously don't want. And I'd mentioned this before, the capacitance of the TBS diode must, must be below whatever standard for like HDMI or USB, whatever you're using, or it's going to de degrade the signal to a point to where it won't work anymore. Oh, those are supposed to be in a line, whoops. So now with an 8.2 volt Zener, so LT Spice, they just had a Zener model. I did not feel, uh, what, and audio? Is the audio not good? Whoops. But yeah, make sure to submit questions on the form. I'm not able to really go through them that much. But audio caught my mind because, caught my eye because you guys have to be able to hear me. So they didn't have a TBS model, so I just went with a Zener diode model, which again, for this is going to be close enough. So with an 8.2 volt Zener, so at 8.2 is when it starts to conduct because they have, again, the different ratings because it's not a TBS diode. At 8.2 volts is when it starts to conduct, and then it's conducting all the way up. It gets to around 12 and a half, 13 volts, and then it begins to come back down. And what's crazy is you look at the current now. The current across D10 is at the low end 28 milliamps, and at the high end like 63-ish milliamps. So that is a pretty drastic difference from the capacitor, which had up to 500 milliamps. So with a single TVS diode, we are able to shunt almost all of that current away from the internal protection and just doing a uh just having the single tbs so now the fourth strategy that i'm going to talk about and this is one you don't hear about a ton and the times that i'll use it up oh, my head again there we go so the times that I have used this in the past is if you add a series resistor on the outside, you can have these shot key diodes also protect against a over voltage event because they just shunt it across and the series resistor protects the diodes, but you can also use it just as an ESD protection. So the shot keys in theory will conduct before the standard diodes because the voltage drop across a shock key diode is going to be less than a standard diode. 
uh, have them conduct for the internal. And this is where I was saying the series impedance or the series resistance of your power supply is important. And not just the power supply, more so your power plane. Because when this is conducting across D2, it is shunting all of that excess voltage to your power plane, so your 5 volt rail, and then to your power supply, depending on what the frequency is. Most of the time, it's going to be just your power plane. So if you're doing this on a two layer board, for example, and you are just using traces for all of your power lines, you're going to have a pretty large impedance there and it's not going to be able to do much to protect D10. Your ground side normally isn't that big of a deal and that's why normally TVS diodes, people on my head again, geez. Normally you use a TVS diode because it shunts it to ground always and your ground as a whole is going to have a much bigger plane than it will with the power rail but just something to consider, there's multiple ways to do this. And that's what I was mentioning with the series, resist series resistors, you can use it to prevent a over voltage event and to help limit the current. So with dual shot key diodes with the 100 ohm power supply impedance, we have a peak of 140-ish volts, and that's compared to our TVS diodes, which are much, much smaller. But if we lower the impedance to the power supply, it's now down to 90 volts compared to 140. So again, all I'm able to simulate is the power supply impedance, but that is in reality your five volt plane that is on your PCB where this is getting shunted. So you have to make sure that if you're going to do the shot key diodes, you have a good low impedance plane, but you also want a good low impedance ground plane no matter what. So now the part that it seems like everybody always wants me to get to is what do I actually use when I'm designing circuits? I mentioned that I use a mixture or at some point I have used all four of these. So on a day-to-day -day basis, what will I use? So if it is, oh, come on, this is really annoying. Uh, let's go here. So if it's a high-speed interface, and by high-speed, I mean pretty much, and actually, before I cover that, something that I did see in the messages that I somehow did overlook. So ESD protection in most products you're going to be designing them with some sort of enclosure that enclosure is going to have connectors it's going to have wires that go from the inside of the board to the outside world esd protection as a whole you only do on the pins that leave the board that go to the outside world because if a board is just sitting there and an io pin just does some stuff on the board as long as you protect the outside connections, nothing on the internal side is going to just magically get ESD. Now, of course, a lightning strike or some massive event that overwhelms something else could get to the internal side. But as a whole, everything I'm talking about is stuff that leaves the board. I saw someone who had mentioned that you don't have to do this to all pins and it should just be for the ones that leave the board. Absolutely correct, I should have mentioned that earlier. So for the high-speed interfaces, USB, Ethernet, HDMI, stuff like that, you're really limited on what you can do because, like I said, if you have too much capacitance, too much series resistance, you're going to degrade the signal to where it doesn't work. So for those, it's pretty easy. I just use a TBS diode that is specced either specifically for that interface or I'll look at what USB 2.0 or 3.0, what their maximum capacitance on any line is, and then I'll pick a TBS diode that is below that. And as long as you do that, you're normally safe. And one thing with that, you don't normally want to just say, oh, I'm using USB 2.0. 
let me get an HDMI TVS diode and I know it, it won't degrade the signal. You don't normally want to do that. It's true, it will not degrade the signal, but as a overgeneralization, the higher the capacitance of a TVS diode, the better it's going to do at protecting that signal. Because if you remember the chart that had the capacitor, a capacitor in and of itself helps to protect from ESD. So a TVS diode with a larger parasitic capacitance just based on the parasitics will perform better. Not to mention it's going to be physically bigger and that's what causes the parasitic. So it'll have typically higher ratings. So if you're using USB 2.0, pick one for USB 2 or USB 3 and just go with that. That's what I do with anything like that. If it's a slower interface, just a general protection. So let's say this is a, let's say this is a button. Let's say this is something that is signaling a LED. Let's say it's anything like that that's leaving the board. I will do exactly the same with the TVS diode, but I'll add R1 here. I'll add a the value depends on what it is. If it's a button, if it's a switch, you could even go to 1K to 4.7K. Again, the higher it is, the better. And that is going to help to limit the current to the TVS diode. It's also going to help to limit the current that goes into the IC itself, as well as all the other benefits that a series resistor has. If it is a slow interface, but it's in a ESD dangerous environment, or it's something that has to be really, really resilient, I add a parallel capacitor to the diode. So this right here is what I would consider not quite the most overkill or bulletproof solution. And I mentioned this in the TBS diode video, I, or the ESD video I did, there are some really cool parts, Borns, Bjorn, Borns, however you pronounce it, has some, Little Fuse has some. They basically are series elements that will open up on a transient or an ESD spike. I would add something like that here, but that is like, that would be really, really extreme. This is what I consider pretty bulletproof for almost everything that I'll do. And with the TVS diode just in and of itself, it's what we saw before. Now, if we add the 220 ohm resistor to it, it will limit the maximum current and it helps to smooth out the spikes between them. Now, if we add a capacitor here, the maximum current other than for the instantaneous point that it turns on is barely even a volt and what's interesting here this is most likely just a simulation artifact this peak but this is the ringing that i was mentioning that can be an issue normally it doesn't actually work this way in the real world because there's enough parasitic resistance to overwhelm this but if this was a larger capacitor and there weren't a lot of parasitics or if you didn't have that series resistor, you could get some ringing here, which can be pretty bad. But the TBS diode's going to soak that up. So it shouldn't be a huge deal, just something to think about. So everything up to this point has been focused on the schematic and on the circuit design side. But that's not the whole story, not by a long shot. You always have to consider what is going on on the physical. You always have to consider what's going on with your head and make sure you're not blocking anything. So just if, if I were to sum up the single biggest thing on the layout side when it comes to placing like a TVS diode, it's place it as close as you can to the connector because every inch, every millimeter away from it, you're increasing the impedance between that spike and the TVS diode, which you don't want to do. So this is a cool chart I found from a uh, Toshiba app note, and it shows just by moving the ESD diode farther away from the connector, 
they were able to get the peak to be a difference of 10 volts, which is kind of crazy. Again, the exact same schematic just by moving the TBS diode closer or farther away. So now in the same same uh, same line of thinking, you want to have super low inductance traces. So the trace that comes in from your connector is nice and wide, so it will be able to have a low impedance path to the TBS diode and to ground. An asterisk here is, of course, high speed signaling. If they're differential or controlled impedance, you can't do that, but if not, it's nice to have the traces be lower inductance and you still want them to be short no matter what you're doing. And you don't wanna run any unprotected traces near protected traces for obvious reasons. Crosstalk you could have, if it's really bad, you could have arcing between the two. So treat the unprotected lines before they get to that TBS treat them as noisy, treat them as dirty, and you don't wanna get any signals near them until they get cleaned up past it. And this is what I was mentioning earlier with the uh, impedance of the power supply, and I know some people in the chat are talking about that. So this is on the ground side. You want to have a very large, good ground plane. Again, most of these PCB layout consider considerations are good PCB layout considerations as a whole, but you want to have a nice big ground plane. You don't want there to be any jumps in it or gaps in it to where the impedance, it's mis mismatched and has to go around traces. If you can have a single full solid plane, that's awesome. If you can tie it to a metal box or a metal enclosure, even better. And the reason why, back to the shot key side, why you have to be careful is you're not gonna be able to do this with a five volt rail, you're just not. So that's why normally you do want to shunt them to ground using TB a TBS diode if you can. So I mentioned that I would cover a few things on the soft failure protection, but I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail again because this isn't my forte and it's not what I focus on. So one thing that is in a real industrial situation to where you should have anyway is some sort of external watchdog monitor. This can be either a dedicated reset IC or it can be a separate microcontroller. And what they do is you basically kick it. You kick the microcontroller or you kick the separate watchdog. And if it doesn't get a kick within however long, it will reset the main microcontroller. Again, like everything else here, this is a great design anyway. So if it is locked up due to a infinite loop or something and you can't get out of it, you reset and you start over. If there's an ESD event and it fries or screws up your RAM registers and it gets all out of whack and it gets stuck, it's going to reset itself. Something Again, that's really good to have anyway is to have a checksum on all of your communication buses. A really common way that an ESD event will mess up on the software end is if you're in the middle of transmitting data between something either on board or off board. If there's a spike, it's most likely going to jumble that message. So use a checksum, you're gonna see, oh, that wasn't right. Redo the communication and call it a day. Then you can also do bit flip detection. So this is kind of in the same note as the watchdog monitor. There are different, especially on like the microprocessor end, you can have specific uh, threads in specific instances that are checking if any bits get skewed. And obviously this is just the RAM. If your flash gets corrupted, you're pretty much out of luck because that's where your program is. But if it's something in your RAM and you can detect it, then you either reset yourself in software or ideally have the external watchdog reset you for it. And then you get a fresh slate of RAM and you get to fix whatever the issue was with it. So that is all I will cover on the firmware side because I'm sure there's quite a few people probably even in the chat who can speak to that more than I can. So in conclusion, there is a ton of ways just like everything in circuit design, especially in the EMC field, 
there's tons of different ways that you can protect a circuit from ESD and there's never going to be one right or perfect way to do it. There's always a lot of wrong ways, but there's never going to be a perfect way. So the four ways that I showed are pretty much the main methods that I will use. And I would say probably 90 to 95% of all the devices that I've worked on will use one or a combination of those four. Rarely will I go outside of that. And it just, it is always dependent on the application, but it's normally not required. And it's big with cost and performance. If this is a consumer widget that is going to be sold for $10, you probably don't have to worry about much of this. It would be a waste of money. If it's a $1,000 industrial control board that needs to run for five years, yeah, you're probably going to want to protect it. So it's just depending on what exactly you're using and what are the expectations for how well it needs to be protected. And as my rule of thumb, which I try to give when I can, is just use a TVS diode. If it is a high speed signal and you need to make sure the signal integrity is going to be held, then just use a TVS diode and make sure it's spec'd for it. If you need to have additional protection and the signal is slow, add a series resistor and potentially a capacitor, and that is going to protect it from almost every event that you can think of, but there's always the freak things that can happen and you better, you always want to hope for the best when that happens when a lightning strike takes out a transformer in front of your office and fries four out of your five hard drives not much you can do there yeah it actually did happen like uh like five five months ago to me i came back from vacation and my front computer wasn't working and every hard drive except one was completely shot and i took apart the hard drives and it had a input fuse to a TVS diode. The input fuse was blown and the TVS diode, diode was failed shorted. So I removed the TVS diode and shorted across the fuse and it worked perfect. So technically their protection worked. It just kind of was annoying that it killed the device, but not a bad way to design for it. So that wraps up. Oh, now I am floating head. Let me get to a better background so I can actually see better. So yeah, that wraps up the lecture. So now let me go through and check out what questions were submitted. Okay. First question is from Immortal. What would be the cheapest way to prevent ESD damage? Cheapest way would be to do absolutely nothing and just hope that the internal protection does it if not i mean tvs diodes are pretty cheap someone who did not put their name is grounding using a eu socket safe slash okay for grounding myself i don't know what you mean if you mean connecting earth ground to yourself i mean sure that's how wrist straps are but you ideally want to have whatever mega ohm resistor there for if not you could still zap stuff but i am not a european union electrician so i have absolutely no idea does the data sheet of an ic indicate to what level esd must be clamped to be safe i.e the max pin does that mean the esd must be clamped below 12, 20 volts tin fever great question i wish i had a better answer for this and this is where the confusion from what like sniper was posting on discord i think comes in and as a whole no they will typically if not always say the human body model that they passed to 
So you can use that and say, hey, it passed a four kilovolt human body model test. If it does that and you're clamping it to the 20 volts or so, yeah, you're probably safe, but no, they aren't normally going to spec it to that because what they'll show in the data sheet is like the absolute max voltage for like a five volt microcontroller pin. That will be say 5.5 or six volts or eight volts. Yet they will also say that each of the pins passed an ESD test of 4,000 volts. So it's, it's just the transient side. They're only going to be specifying for continuous. So it's kind of a shame, but is what it is. Does grounding the power supply connected to a PCB do anything in terms of ESD, i.e. syncing the ESD surge to ground? That is from, didn't put his name. Yeah, so that's basically what we were talking about there at the end. There are really no negatives to having a nice big ground plane. If you ground the enclosure to make that plane bigger, you run the risk of ground loops and stuff. But as long as it's not connecting to other devices, you normally don't have to worry about it. But yeah, the bigger the ground plane, the bigger that is for ESD, the better it is. What would be a good pick guide for an STM32 MCU TVS diode? Again, it depends on what the uh, what the signal is. Can we use series resistors on communication line, I squared C, SPI, and UART and analog input pins? Does it affect signal integrity? Does it affect signal integrity? Yes. Sometimes it affects it in a positive way when it reduces reflections or ringing. Sometimes it affects it in a negative way. For the signals that you just mentioned, I squared C, SPI, and UART, those are all really low speed. So yes, you can absolutely throw series resistors on all of them. In fact, when I design with them, we normally will do that. One thing with I squared C is they are very sensitive to the bus capacitance. So make sure you're aware of that because I know, I forget what it is, but it's lower than you would think it would be. And I've done it on accident, putting a larger capacitor and it didn't work. So it does have an impact, but series resistors, no, you should be fine. I was a bit confused with clamping voltage of TVS diodes. Is it forward ver voltage or reverse voltage? Yeah, I kind of butchered that. So give me one second. So on, oh, I'm not sharing my screen. You're not gonna be able to see that. Whoops, let me come back. Let me bolt that, I'll come back to it. Are there scenarios when you need a TVS diode to both ground and VCC like they do inside the ICs? Why do they do that? So, good question again, uh, tin fever. So the ones that are inside the IC, those are not TVS diodes. Oh, we got more. We did good without any uh, any spam for a while. Oh, come on. Like, I, I don't get it. You can ban the user, and yet they're still able to keep posting. It's like, I, I, I don't get it. Uh, the scenario is, why do they do that? So the ones inside the IC, those are just standard diodes, so they don't have a reverse breakdown like a TVS diode does. So they, by default, have to have both the high and the low side. Why do they do that over a TVS diode? I have no idea. The fact that all of them do it this way, at least the majority, I have to assume there's a reason and it makes it on the actual silicon side easier to manufacture if i had to guess i don't know then your first question or the first part is there a scenario when you need it to both ground and vcc like the shot keys i mentioned why i do that sometimes you will sometimes see and this one maybe if i have time i'll look i'll try to find one you will see some like not even like overkill TVS diodes, but you will see some sometimes that will have a common rail for like HDMI or something. And they will have TVS diodes and shot key rail to rail. I don't know why they do that. I guess just additional protection, but I, I couldn't tell you exactly why. 
Is a V clamp that is lower better or at what point less is no longer useful, immortal? Good question. I would be lying if I said I don't try to look for a lower V clamp just because obviously I do. <laughs> So yes, I, I always try to, or at what point is it not useful? Probably the point that we try looking for a lower one because as long as we're cutting that 4,000 volt spike to 20 volts, you've already beaten half the battle. So I don't think it's a huge deal, but yes, I always do that. If you have a connector with 100 pins, would most of them need ESD protection then from Brian? Good question. So as much as I hate to say this, because I normally try not to, I have to say it depends. If it's something, if it has 100 pins, first off, a good portion of them should, like really should be ground pins. So you're not going to have 100 IO pins that are on there. But yes, if it's going like at our pick and place, we've got like the, the S NEMA, uh, uh, conveyor communication lines which have like sometimes like 15 lines and then we've got some different interfaces within the pick and place that talk to different modules sure those are all going to be protected from tbs is it overkill if you're buying a hundred and however many thousand dollar pick and place is spending five dollars on the tbs diodes overkill probably not how would you integrate ESD protection and overvoltage? Someone shorts the 12 volt and rail in question together. Oh, good, good question. Good question. Uh, let me wrap the text so I can read this. Could you have a TVS that cuts off the voltage? Okay, let me also come back to that. Would you ever use a spark gap or a PCB spark cap? Would I? So I can answer, have I? No. A PCB spark gap? No. That is obviously for lightning strikes, for mains. I haven't run into a situation to where I've needed to. Them in like the, the MOV, like the different, like the super high voltage ESD stuff, I've never really messed with, but sure, it's, it's useful. Can buck power supply output connectors need ESD protection? As a whole, no. You For ESD specifically, those are going to be large enough planes. They're going to have a big enough rail there to where it's probably not going to impact it that much. You can still have it because it still helps with transients and other stuff. But as a whole, no, your power supply side, you normally don't throw anything on it. If I have a large heat sink that is not live, should I connect it to ground? Do I put ESD protection on it too? That's another, it depends. Um, you don't want to start going to like every single piece of metal connecting to ground just because you can. I mean, you certainly can. And it depends a lot if you're dealing with mains too. If you have mains, again, depending on where you live but as a whole if you're dealing with mains everything that a person a user can touch that is metal has to be earth grounded so if something comes loose if 120 volts ac comes loose and shorts to anything that is metal it's going to blow your gfci or your internal fuse but for esd yeah it helps to have more metal but i don't think you want to go so overboard Okay, so now those are all the questions I have for now. Maybe did any more get posted? Let me see. Yes, a few more got posted. And I haven't forgot the ones that I said I'd come back to. I just want to get through the like easier questions that I don't have to show anything thank you for the lecture do you have any finished layout examples i do not that i can show quick question what are some of the most common standards to follow for an outdoor robot application that is very very specific so standards and knowing which one you use for which is really hard and as a whole 
it's not normally up to the designer to know the standards. You're normally told or talked to a consulting agency that then tells you the standard just because there's thousands and thousands of standards and I, I don't know them, so I wouldn't be able to give you one. I see in one design connecting RC filter between motor ground and PCB ground for ESD and a BLDC, brushless DC motor application. Can you explain why? So they have different grounds? I don't know. As a whole, my other rule of thumb is never to have split grounds. In certain scenarios, it can absolutely help but in the majority of the situations, having separate grounds is a bad idea. So, and you'll see it a lot of times, they'll talk about having, oh, have a clean ground for this, a dirty ground for that. You're just going to screw yourself up most of the time. So, okay, so that is the last of those. So now let me, so let me share my screen again. Okay, so the first question is bit confused with clamping voltage. Is it forward or reverse voltage? So D1 is reverse biased. So everything in every one of the specs that I mentioned is when it is reverse biased. That's the other big difference between TBS diodes and Zener diodes is with a TV or with a TBS and Zener diode compared to shot key and regular diodes they are specifying when it is reverse biased because that's when they're used most of the time. So all of those specs are when it's in this configuration. Just keep in mind, it can also still conduct in this direction as a normal diode. And that's why people get confused with a unidirectional versus a bidirectional diode. It still conducts like a normal diode. It still is a diode. So are there scenarios we need a TVS? So yes, let me let me try and find a example of this. I don't know if I'm going to be able to within a couple minutes, but give me a second and see. Well, that was very quick. So it's not actually the part, but it is showing what the diagram is. So you will see, you will see some diodes act. Actually, it's not. Yeah, this is just showing the bidirectional. Never mind. Crap, I thought this was different. So you will sometimes see a device that is like this but the bottom standard diode will be up here and then it'll have a power rail side why are those sold i guess just for extra protection instead of just beefing up the tbs diode i don't know i thought just by glancing from the google image i thought that's what this was but yeah this is just duplicating a bi-directional diode and yeah this is what a bi-directional one looks like a lot of people when they first start using TBS diodes use this for everything because they think again that that's used for that's what's used for uh, the positive and negative T, uh, ESD events it's not so now the last question how would you integrate ESD protection and over voltage protection someone shorts the 12 volt and 5 volt rail in question together wouldn't the TVS diode burn up since it's long-term over-voltage? Could you have a TVS and then back-to-back -back end feds that cuts off the over-voltage from burning up their TVS and then the IC input? Does the source of a FET need an ES? Okay, so as for can you do that with back-to-back -back end FETs with the TVS diode? Sure. That's not something that I have ever done, but what I will show you is... So what you have to keep in mind with this is if you size, and I've done this before, also with a larger resistor here on a IO pin, you can effectively protect the downstream device or this device from an over voltage and over current 
by using the TVS diode here. So if this is an input pin and you apply 12 volts to this, if you do the back to back, uh, actually, yeah, I was showing the wrong picture, sorry. So this was the example that I was saying. So if you have the dual shot keys here and you have a series resistor on this side and you apply 12 volts to this, the resistor is going to limit the current. It's going to go through here and go to your power plane and it's going to protect the voltage side on here. So you can absolutely use TVS diodes or shot key diodes to have multiple use cases which is why at the start I was saying that ESD protection is good design in general because it helps to protect against multiple things, including transients and over voltage. The back-to-back -back FETs, yeah, I don't see why you couldn't. I would, at that point, I would start to wonder, is this a theoretical question or an actual use case? Because as a whole, an I.O. pin on a microcontroller, you normally don't expect to have overvoltage that often. It would normally be on the main input connector to the board, which is when you would use NFETs. And then does the source of, an N of a FET need ESD protection? Normally the gate, or not normally, a gate of a MOSFET is by far the most, the most dangerous position. And in my however many years of doing this, the only time I have ever witnessed from like an assembly standpoint, ESD killing a device has been on a MOSFET on the gate because they are pretty sensitive. But as a whole, once it's mounted, the gate ten typically doesn't leave the board. So you can add it on there and we'll do it sometimes. You normally don't have to. As for the source, it, it depends if it's leaving the board or not. But normally, no, it's normally the gate that's the most specific. The reason for not using series resistors was because 5 volt power is 25 amps and 12 volt is 125 amps. Yeah, yeah, that would do it. So yes, now I would see why you would want to do the back-to-back -back NFETs. That's funny. But yeah, so that is the last of the questions um i can check to see if any more got posted if not let me know if you have anything else and if not we can call it a day oh dang a lot more got posted yeah maybe once the live stream's over just ask them here because now i have to keep going through and checking which ones which ones are new Okay, I'm designing a control system for a turbo jet, and I have 25 amp inrush current for the igniter, which signal which settles to continuous 8 amps. Will the gate driver have to be rated to handle the 25 amps, or even the and or the 8 amps? So the igniter is a resistor load and the gate driver what gate is it driving uh but let's say it's driving a mosfet yeah it has to be rated for whatever the peak current is I, I'm, I'm struggling with what the actual drive is here does it make sense to add esd protection to a peripheral device on its cable input where its only path to ground is through that cable So you have a cable going in, it supplies ground. You want to know if you want to protect that device. Yeah, you would still do it because you're going to have a ground plane on that peripheral device and you want to protect that. The only time stuff like that gets super like hairy is if you're chaining multiple devices. That's when you really have to worry about ground loops. But a single device to another, yeah, that should be fine, and I would do it. If you're doing board buildup or prototyping where maybe you don't have an enclosure to make probing easier, do you put extra ESD protection to protect other ICs that normally don't have contact with the outside world? 
So I made that little joke at the beginning about Unexpected Maker, his channel, they have a joke that says ESD doesn't exist. When I just said a minute ago, the only time I've ever seen it happen to me that I can pinpoint that was ESD was on a MOSFET. It's good to design for this. And when you're designing for industrial applications, you better design for it. But I've never had it happen to me. So probing stuff, no. I mean, if uh, everything we have is going to be on an ESD safe mat, we're going to be grounded. No, you're not going to have an issue with that. The only time it's an issue is with the bare part. If you're in a controlled environment, the only time it's going to be an issue is if it's not assembled yet and even then if you're in a controlled environment you're normally fine so no i would not bother doing that what about electronics where the circuit is powered by a battery good question yeah so you still want to do that just because it doesn't ground back to earth it doesn't matter think about 99 percent of dc that come from the wall it's going to go through an isolation transformer so it's technically decoupled from earth's ground that's why your ground plane needs to be big so it can act like a little virtual ground to shunt everything through so yeah you still want to do it if it's a battery in simulation what would be a good estimate for the series resistance of let's say an adc 50k oh no way more than that but oh wait series resistance are you talking about series resistance like going to the ADC or internal to the ADC? Most most analog pins are going to be mega ohm plus. They're super high impedance. Would logic level MOSFETs be suitable to drive solenoids which are at 16 volts DC and 24 volt DC with 0.3 amps? Oh yeah. Logic level MOSFETs have gotten like crazy good in the last little while. So you can totally drive something that's only 0.3 amps. Sorry to leave midstream. I'll catch the tomorrow and see you on Discord. Thanks for the stream tonight. Oh, no worries. I'll see you later. I've been looking at the Mac 16141 when it looks like you can do overcurrent cutoff of a back to back bed to protect over voltage. Thinking I put the TVS behind the Max to prevent burn. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Well, cool, guys. So, yeah, I think I think I am going to call it a stream. So I'm going to be hopefully back to doing something every other week. So it'll either be a stream in two weeks, probably continuing this series, or it's going to be another video, depending on what uh, depending on what I get around to doing. So as always, let me know or I guess first, if you haven't joined the discord, make sure you do that. And if you have suggestions for any future series on this stream or a future topic for this series, let me know. And if you have anything, any suggestions for any topics for videos or streams, let me know that as well. And I really appreciate you guys tuning in and I will see you guys later.